Hello everyone, I'm still working hard on the second episode about the Rocket Flames. It should be released in several weeks from now. I spend more time on it than on the first episode, and I think it will be better, at least I prefer it. So if you liked the first one, you should love the next one. In the meantime, I decided to first release a video about a rare opportunity that Space Geeks had in early February this year, the maiden flight of the Falcon Heavy. This was my very first launch, and I did not want to miss the opportunity to watch such a beast lifting off and to witness the landing of its two boosters. I know I'm releasing this video four months after the launch, an eternity in YouTube time, but in fact the French version of it was released soon after, when this English channel did not exist yet. But I thought you might be interested in my take though. This video is not a real technical episode and has no technical or educational purpose. It's just a simple video where I will relate my experience of preparation for this launch and the launch day itself. Many other Falcon Heavy launch videos already exist, but I'll try to show you something a bit different. I'll give you a lot of details so that you can imagine you're there yourself just by watching these images and so that you could organize such a trip of your own for the next Falcon Heavy launch. Everything started the 24th of January with the static fire of the rocket, which was a mandatory step before having a reliable launch date. Soon after, it was clear the test was good enough and the launch date would soon be official. Rumors said that expensive places would be available at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, or KSCVC, relatively close to the launch pad. In the meantime, the KSCVC website indicated that it may be slow as the Falcon Heavy tickets would be sold. I couldn't miss this opportunity. The day after, on January 25th, I spent my whole day tapping F5 to refresh my browser and see the places appearing in real time. And yes, it worked. I saw the site being updated before my eyes, but they were first available only by phone. I then spent 30 minutes and a lot of money by phone, but their line was saturated. Then they finally authorized the sales by internet and different options were available at different prices. Fortunately, I had already spent several days studying the possible viewing sites open to the public. I will summarize all of this for you, it may be useful to you in case you plan to watch a Falcon Heavy launch later. Here is the zone of the different launch pad of Kennedy Space Center and of the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station as seen from space. This place is huge, but fortunately such a rocket can be seen from far away. This is the launch pad. In its vicinity, there are several observation sites that were authorized that day. Here, next to the VAB, you have all the accredited press and some VIPs, 3.1 miles or 5 kilometers from the launch pad. I literally dream of putting my cameras near the pad and watching a launch from this site one day. It was the closest site from the launch pad. Here is the Apollo Saturn V Center, where I attended the launch. We were 3.9 miles or 6 kilometers from the pad. Other media attendees and VIPs were here at 6.6 .6 miles or 11 kilometers from the pad on the causeway. Finally, the other places sold by the KSC were here, some 7.4 miles or 12 kilometers from the pad. For those who couldn't or didn't want to pay for places, there were some public areas where the lounge could be seen as well. Here, the Playa Linda Beach in the north, which was rapidly full and close to the public on launch day, was 4.6 miles or 7.5 kilometers from the launch pad. The Max Burra Bridge in Titusville was 11 miles or 18 kilometers from the pad. And in the south, there was the Port Canaveral area, which was 13 miles or 21 kilometers from the pad, and the Cocoa Beach area, roughly 23 kilometers from the pad. But this flight included landings as well, of course, and the distances were quite different for each site. The best places were at the NASA Causeway at 4.3 miles or 7 kilometers from the landing zone. Port Canaveral was 6 miles or 10 kilometers away, and the press site 9 miles or 15 kilometers away. I was at 11 miles or 18 kilometers away, and the other areas were even further. At the end, with the exception of lucky people on the NASA Causeway, nobody was closer than 6 miles or 10 kilometers from the landing zones. In conclusion, I was really well located to watch this launch, moreover considering that this day the wind came from this direction, so the sound was terrific as you will hear that in a moment. Several tickets were sold, but I wanted only one of them, the closest one from the launch pad at the Apollo Saturn V Center that was called Feel the Heat, sounds promising. 
but I had been told that the landings were difficult to spot from this place because the view was blocked by some buildings. I then made my own calculations with Google Earth using 3D models of each building, and I could see that there was some room between the buildings that offer some possibilities to see the landing from the observation area. I then thoroughly studied the geometry, printed that on a map and prayed to arrive early enough on D-Day having mapped the places where we could see all parts of the flight. So I immediately bought my ticket, even without being sure I could travel to the US. Several hours later, all 3000 tickets were sold, probably 3000 people that were eagerly waiting for this moment like me. Two days later, 27th of January, Elon Musk finally announced that the expected launch date was the 6th of February. Elon often provides optimistic plannings, and the Maiden flight is often late, but I had to take the risk, and many people said this date was credible. So, I broke my piggy bank and looked for low-cost flights and housing. I could find a Toulouse-Miami for 400 euros in an A380 and a motel for a week. But I had to be fast, the prices were already ramping up and I couldn't wait for a safe last minute. So I booked everything and I had in mind to arrive the evening before the launch and to remain in the KC area for a full week in case the launch was postponed. With several days in front of me to be well prepared for the launch, I bought a big memory card and brought a GoPro to put on my head and another one that would record a sound level meter to know the absolute sound level during the launch. Receiving the tickets was a nightmare, as they refused to mail them outside of the US. At the end of the day, I could receive them at the motel, and it was way harder than anticipated, and believe me, I was really not far from not having my tickets at all. The stress was intense then. To enter the KSCVC parking lot, this pink placard was mandatory in the vehicle, where the time of arrival was clearly indicated to avoid a huge jam. As I bought one of the very first tickets, I got the placard indicating the earliest arrival time. Oh my god, it was such a relief. I could maybe go to the precise place I wanted in the bleachers or on the grass. And then I finally took the flight to the US the day before the launch. I woke up at 4.45 and arrived at KSC at 5.30. It was still dark and hundreds of employees were already on their way to the main gate. We were lucky enough to see the rocket by night. We could clearly see it with binoculars from the road where she was shining in the black of the night. Then we waited in front of the visitor center main gates until they opened it for the early birds. After the checkpoint, I could park very close to the park entrance and then wait in a second line while enjoying the first lights of dawn. Rapidly, hundreds of people gathered behind us. After one hour, they opened the gate and I rushed toward the buses that would bring us to the observation site. It was 8 in the morning, the launch was planned at 1.30 pm. We were given some goodies, including this nice glass with a pretty drawing of a chicken heavy on it, then another wait on the bus as we had to wait until four buses were full before leaving. 8.30 the four first buses were full, we finally could go. Considering the exceptional circumstances, we were first brought to the space shuttle runway. For me, it was a kid's dream becoming reality. This place is usually closed to the public. We spent 15 minutes there, it was a very clear and nice day, and I walked there as we float in dream. We stopped where the last space shuttle stopped for the last time, and where a plaque was put in honor of the program, and it's already time to go back to the bus for our final destination. Being in the first bus, I still had hope to get to the place I scrutinized for days on aerial pictures. As we arrived at the center, I rushed below the Saturn V rocket, and I didn't even look at her, I ran to my place. I would have all the time I wanted to admire this rocket and the other artifacts later that day. I was almost the very first one to arrive here and yes, nobody was there yet. I switched off my camera, rushed to the bleacher and finally sat down. The stress went down. I had crossed an ocean and spent all the money I had to be at this place this day. The weather was nice, it was almost too good to be true. I crossed my fingers not to have any scrub, I really don't want to do this all over again the day after. And then I have put my eyes on the horizon and could see the launcher on the historic pad 39A of the Apollo 11 mission for the second time that day. Well, to be honest, we saw the pad only, as the launcher was located just behind the structure from where we were, and we could barely see its white color. And then the long wait started, but we could spend our time enjoying the Saturn V center. 
This place was incredible. Only several meters separated the giant rocket from the bleachers, and the stress gradually climbed up as the launch was delayed several times. And four times we could see the clock freezing and restarting from a bit earlier. We had been warned that high altitude winds were too strong and were 20% above the limits, but the launch was not scrubbed yet. Maybe these winds would calm down before the two and a half hour long launch window closes. Ultimately, the launch time was delayed until 15 minutes before the closure of the window, and everybody was convinced it would be scrubbed. But for the first time, the clock indicated T minus 1 hour 25 minutes, and I knew they started to fill the tanks at that moment, so hope came back a little. At T minus 30 minutes, big puffs of white clouds were vented from the launcher. The tanks were getting filled, and as planned, the oxygen began to boil off. That was a very good sign. And then 10 minutes before liftoff. Everybody wanted to believe it will lift off and time ran so fast. I set my GoPro to measuring the sound level, I changed the battery of my camera, and then finally the very last second of the countdown. I didn't dare to believe in a scrub, I had already had too many up and downs for several days. And just before showing you my footage of the launch, I just briefly explained a point so that you can imagine watching the launch with your own eyes just by watching it on your screen. This is my camera, and its telezoom is not very big, which I chose it on purpose. You'll find many videos where you could count the bolts on the launcher, but this is not what people actually saw. This is an extreme case of someone recording the launch through a big telescope. On the other hand, wide-angle cameras do not represent what you could see as well. That's why I've chosen a zoom that shows roughly what I saw with my naked eyes on your desktop screen. The details you will see in the video, I probably could see them. Those you don't see, I probably didn't either. And sometimes we'll see the angle varies, or the rocket is out of the frame. It's because I wanted to watch this launch with my own eyes and not through a camera screen. I wanted to leave my first launch at 100%, so some concessions were made for the tracking quality. And just a last point. Considering the expected launch volume, I had to put the gain of my microphone to its minimum, and it didn't saturate. Listen carefully to the sounds before liftoff and adjust the volume of your speakers or headset so that it seems natural to you. Now, I'll stay quiet and let you enjoy the launch as we did. Down from 10 seconds, okay? I want everybody counting, follow the clock. We're at 23, 22, we'll count it from 10. Not yet. <laughs> All right, here we go, folks. Loud. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and lift off! qui apparaissent Oh. 
Reports show that the M1D engine performance is nominal. Side boosters have begun to throttle down in preparation for the upcoming shutdown in 20 seconds. Ah, ce bruit, c'est incroyable. Major event coming up with side booster shutdown and separation. Side booster shutdown. Side boosters. some of those aerodynamic forces and heating that occurs when you're moving that quickly through the atmosphere. Living that day was something really unique, and I hope you'll have the opportunity to live that at least once in your life. The day after, I had the opportunity to go on a bus tour to see the launch pad and another day to see one of the boosters still standing on LZ2. Three days later, I could see the drone ship coming back to the port. It was empty of course as the central core crashed just next to it. That or discussing with the launch photographer Brady Kellingston on the exploration tower in front of the drone ship is the kind of extra you can enjoy at Cocoa Beach after a launch. I hope this video motivated you to attend such a launch one day if you did not already have this chance. Believe me, you'll remember it for the rest of your life. See you soon for the second episode about Rocket Flames. And thanks for watching.